Welcome back to the Tech One Two podcast. I'm very excited today to have a very special guest in the studio today. We have Nick Stavropoulos, the Empath CFO, in the studio. Great to have you today. Man, special. Yes, I do feel special. And thank you for inviting me back to the podcast. I guess I did a pretty good job last time. And for those who don't know, CFO stands for Chief Fund Officer of the company. Absolutely. You make finance fun at Empist. And today, we have a very special topic to talk about, which is Section 179. That's something that's very important, to, especially to small and medium-sized businesses. And we're hoping today that we can bring some value to all the small and medium-sized businesses as we're wrapping up the end of the year, going into 2025, on things that they should really consider, perhaps there could be some tax incentives that they can see with Section 179. So for the audience, just at a very high level, what is Section 179? Yes, it's funny. Every time we mention Section 179, I can't help of Christmas. The question is, is it Christmas for the business and the business owner, or is it Christmas for the IRS figuring out, hey, this guy may have made a little extra income this year. I need to pay a little closer attention. Uh, in all kidding aside, though, Section 179, 179 is a wonderful tool that the IRS allows businesses just like us, just like our audience to use in order to take advantage of not only a taxation part of their business, meaning to lower the tax liability, but also to an incentive to invest back into their business and use the money for business purposes. (laughs) Money that uh, can be used to purchase certain equipment, anything from hardware, sometimes software, uh, sometimes real estate in special occasions. Um, Many companies who are in the tracking world or the manufacturing world to buy new units for themselves and then take up to a maximum of 60 or 80%, depending the code and the item that they're purchasing in depreciation for that particular time period. So it's yes, it's a wonderful tool. It has its pluses, many more pluses than negatives, but it also has a couple of negatives. So this this uh, Section 179, it's this uh, tax code. It's a tax code that was uh, created, and just looking back at history, I think it was in ni- 1980 when it first, 1987, uh, that first came out, and um, it's a special stimulus for the small and medium-sized businesses. The key is the small and medium-sized businesses, and that's what it's really catered to. It isn't catered to the fortune-sized organization because, you know, their investments in, you know, whether it's equipment or technology, pro- most likely far far exceeds what the benefit is of Section 179, correct? Correct. So every year it changes, so although it's been around for a long time, Everybody needs to be paying, paying special attention through your accountant, through your CPA, through your CFO, the changes in every year's uh, tax law. Mm-hmm. Uh, where we are right now, it stands a little over a million dollars that you can spend. There is a maximum of two and a half million cap, but that's on certain occasions. And then, of course, the amount of depreciation you're going to enjoy from those purchases depends on the type of things that you purchase for your business. So, yes, it's there to help the SMBs, the businesses just like us, just like our clients, to, again, uh, have a benefit on taxes, invest in their business, and make them make decisions faster and better. You know, it's funny that we say this, but many times businesses put off large purchases for any particular reason. And Section 179 is one of those little tools that when you sit down and start analyzing, you're like, you know what? Not only makes sense financially, operationally to buy this business, but tax-wise as well, that's all three align. Let's go ahead and do it. Okay, perfect. So, so we've seen this amount increase over the years. So back in 2000, I believe the amount of stimulus was $20,000. Um, now you mentioned it's over a million dollars with some bonuses, get you over 2.5, perhaps even up to $3 million. Um, but what is the real benefit to a business? So um, if I'm a business owner, which I am, um, I purchase, let's say equipment, let's say it's technology. Um I normally would have to write that off. It's a business expense, so I write it off. But normally, it'll it'll follow some sort of depreciation schedule. So it'll be, let's just say I was on a three-year depreciation, maybe a five-year, whatever that might be. So what's the difference between me purchasing something under normal business expenses and normal taxation compared to the purchase of equipment that would qualify under a Section 179? Yeah, great question. I think let's take it a step farther and see why a business should consider, first of all, participating in Section 179. Uh, Traditionally, it's been businesses that had a a fantastic run for the year, Mm -hmm. and maybe they're in the type of industry where they don't have 
a lot of depreciable assets. Uh, maybe they're in the servicing industry, like us, uh, where our main capital is human, the human capital. Mm -hmm. So many businesses who might have done really good through the past uh, fiscal year, they're like, listen, we have a couple of choices here. Uh, we have made some great net income, and we're prepared to pay the IRS uh, tax payment for that. Uh, or let's reduce our tax liability, and the best way of doing it is kick it back into the economy and back into our business through purchases. That's the one type of business that might have a Section 179 conversation. The other one is, is literally any business under the sun, whether you've done well or not done well, because it allows you, again, to make an investment towards your business that's going to be very useful for the year to come. Uh, you will take the tax, the, the tax benefit, and you avoid many little mistakes that smaller businesses make, which is for some businesses, fortunately or unfortunately, the owner uses their business also as a personal piggy bank, mm -hmm. and it will be a choice between buying a Ferrari or buying a quarter million dollar machine that once you put into your manufacturing line is going to create you more, um, more uh, make more sense. Okay. So when you say I'm going to buy something, yes, you could always go buy that Ferrari and put it on the business, and then just take the one-time business expense for the year and you use it for business purposes. Or you can say I'm going to buy that manufacturing line that I can put under Section 179, I will get all the depreciation benefits from it, and my business is going to benefit because operational is going to be more effective. I'm going to perhaps create more volume of our products and services. Okay. So, and to be clear for everyone, we're not tax professionals. Uh, we're not providing tax advice. Um, anything that we're talking about during this podcast today, it's based on experiences that we've had, conversations, but we, we recommend that you speak with your tax professionals, your accountants, before making any decisions on purchases. There are some qualifiers for Section 179. So when we talked about the depreciation just over five years, the five-year or three-year um, means that, let's just use some round numbers. Um, if I was purchasing a piece of equipment, uh, let's say technology, maybe it was a server that I was purchasing, and that whole uh, environment costs $100,000. And I was on a five-year depreciation schedule, if you weren't using Section 179, you would depreciate $20,000 per year over five years. Correct. So your tax benefit would only be on that $20,000 for that first year. So let's just say you were on a 30% uh, tax, uh, uh, bracket. Uh, tax bracket. Yeah. You know That's how you would calculate the tax savings. However, if you had a good year and you had a uh, high net profit, and you wanted to reduce your tax liability, we're not talking about doing anything that would be unethical or, or you know, that you'd be bypassing something. It's all about how can you utilize then that, that uh, tax savings to continue to reinvest back into the business. And you brought up a great point about that reinvestment piece of it. So the big thing about Section 179 is if you are purchasing the the um, equipment, you can write it off all in that year that you purchase it. So in 2024, we're approaching the end of 2024, could be businesses out there who have, um, who've had a, good, a great year. Yep. Um, we know many businesses that have, and you know that could be an opportunity for them to invest now for future and also see the tax benefit, uh, which I think would be um, something that would be very appealing to a business owner, even to finance too. Yeah, and you bring up a good point. For businesses who are continuously purchasing equipment, because either it's the life cycle of their business where it's some certain equipment, A, every three years, this is completely done, not only on the books, but also operationally for my business. So I need to have, for example, the tracking industry. The tracking industry continuously is purchasing equipment, right? So they need to have rolling stock, rolling trucks all the time coming in and going. Section 179 may not be the most beneficial because what they need to do is they need to stagger that equipment so every year they have um, expenses that they cannot deduct from their business. Mm -hmm. um, Section 179, once you use that depreciation, it's gone. You cannot reuse it again. So next year you cannot say, I have this piece of equipment, Mr. Accountant. What mm -hmm. about getting some deduction on that? You've already depreciated it. You have already depreciated it. So then what do you do? If you're the type of business that doesn't have the need for rolling stock all the time or change inventory or, I'm sorry, change infrastructure all the time in your business, 
you kind of put yourself in the corner because now you run out of options. What else can you expense under uh, Section 179, right? Sure. So it's not for everybody. Businesses have to really see what's beneficial to them because if you start any business and you have a schedule that as you grow in the business or because of depreciation as far as operationally first and then in value of any equipment, you have to continuously replenish your equipment, Section 179 may not be for you. Sure. You could use it and say, I'm going to be buying five pieces of equipment every year, and every time I do it, Section 179. But that's a very predictable process, and more businesses cannot judge that, especially when you depend on the economy or other vendors who depend on other people uh, that are going to be your business. Because the last thing you want to do is purchase a bunch of equipment and it's just sitting there, right? Yes, you get the tax benefit for one year, but yeah. then there's no other return on investment. Yeah, if you don't need the equipment, I mean, if you don't need whatever that purchase is, it would just be a waste of money. But one of the things that we've seen, especially, obviously, we're in the tech space and our clients um, who we offer life cycle management for, and we go through proper life cycle management of their assets and their inventory, it's a huge benefit to them because they know that they're going to replace, let's just say, a third of their machines every year. So every three every year they're replacing a third of those machines. Those types of purchases um, most of the times will qualify under Section One Seventy Nine. Right. So if I'm going to purchase new laptops for my for uh, my staff, a third of the staff, um, you can do that and receive that tax benefit today. And if you're on that uh, three year rotation, and we just say, look, thirty, you're going to replace thirty three percent of your staff's uh, assets in the year. That's a great. I mean, we've seen it. We've received some amazing feedback from clients too, because yeah, it's that. It's a great benefit there. So yeah, it is. It is. So when we look at uh, you know, there's obviously the purchase of it, and we look at the capital expenditure, um, but there are some uh, opportunities to still lease equipment on based on the equipment that you're that you're purchasing. You're agreeing to purchase under a lease that can still qualify. So that's one of the things that. I believe many businesses just don't understand. They may be familiar with this. They've heard of Section 179. They've heard of this tax incentive, this tax code, that the stimulus. But they're like, I don't have the cash. I know I need this. I need this for next year. I would love to be able to take advantage of some sort of tax incentive. And maybe they didn't have a great year. But it can still reduce their liability, their tax liability. And, it, and that some of that may carry over. But um, they can still lease the equipment, go under a lease where they're not they don't have all the cash. Up yeah, front. all the cash flow. They may not have the cash flow to do this. So there are certain business leases that still qualify under this yeah. because it's that full purchase, and then the payments get rolled into you know whether you do a three year, uh, you know one dollar buyout or a fair market value lease. Yes. So you have to be very careful what type of lease instrument yeah. you, you join. Hundred um, percent. If it's something that you know at the end of the term you're going to own, then Section 179 is pretty good for you. Mm -hmm. uh, there's certain things that you buy under a lease agreement with a company that you can't even put on your balance sheet or on your book of business as something that you can depreciate yourself. Somebody else is enjoying that. Mm -hmm. Of course, the benefit for you is that you enjoy putting a machine to work for you for an ROI for your business, and then you have um, lesser of a payment than if you purchased it. Okay. So you, uh, you may be wondering, businesses may be wondering, do I even qualify for something like this? Yeah. Like, what do I need to do? If you're if you're a small, what are the qualifications? Yeah. Are there qualifications that people should consider? First of all, like you mentioned, always talk to your uh, tax advisor, to your accountant, your CPA, or your CFO if you have one in-house. Uh, but before you even do that qualification, you got to understand what is the master plan here. Nothing in business has to be done at random, as we know, or because we heard, hey, somebody else is doing Section 179, they're saving money in taxes, or because, man, I really don't want to pay the tax man this year. I want to reduce my liability as much as possible. This should be the last benefit of the, or the last section as part of a series of questions and discussions you, ha you need to have with all those professionals, but also internally with your executive team and your team, it's about what you're trying to accomplish. This is so important because we've seen it time and time again where we didn't I plan ahead of the next year. We didn't really know where it was, but we made an estimate and we're like, you know what? Let's just buy this because we know we're going to use it at some point next mm -hmm. year. That can go terribly wrong for a business. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a waste of money at it that is. point. It so is. you have to have a plan. Yes, I totally agree. I mean, so when you, we talked small, medium sized businesses, obviously a large enterprise probably wouldn't qualify or they wouldn't benefit from this. But yeah, if you are making those types of purchases or investments back in the business, speak with your tax advisor, accountant, CFO, whoever the financial yep. professional is within your business. So what are some of the common mistakes? Um, I mean, you mentioned purchase 
a, a purchase and not have a need for it just for the tax incentive. What are some other common mistakes that uh, you believe a business w- can you know face that we can help them avoid those? Yeah, um, as part of forecasting for every year, you should always not try to forecast your top line revenue, but also do your cost of goods sold, your open expenses, and see how much the business should net at the end of the year if you execute everything that you said you're going to execute. Mm-hmm. That's really important when it comes to discussions on Section 179. So it's not that, hey, I'm going to buy a machine and I'm going to put it to work and I'm going to have this type of net income. Well, the net income of a company doesn't only come from one machine. It comes from multiple factors and multiple streams of revenue sometimes. Sure. So you got to be very careful into how you plan your next year and how this only particular small piece of the deal really fits in the bigger part of the puzzle. Okay. That's the number one thing that you have to consider. Secondly, we mentioned before, what type of instruments, financial instruments, you're going to use in order to obtain a Section 179 deductible asset? If it's a lease, what type of lease? Is it the triad lease? Is it the right lease, I'm sorry? Uh, what is going to happen at the end of this lease? Who truly owns a piece of equipment? What I could, out of any situation, deduct from my end and not be able to deduct? Third thing is, you really don't want to deplete all your cash in order to avoid paying taxes, right? A business, to stay healthy, always has to have a cash reserve. We sure. always recommend, absolutely, mm-hmm. minimum of six months of cash on the side for operations. Mm-hmm. That should be something that any business should strive Some for. Reserves, yeah. Exactly. So don't look at it in the, oh, no, it's okay because I know cash will keep coming because especially small business owners, they think about the first of the month all the time, man, cash is coming, cash, uh, it's okay, I'm going to spend my cash now, but cash is going to come again and it's going to come again. That's a big mistake. And they deplete their account. Let's say they become a victim of a cyber attack. Mm-hmm. And now everything is locked up and they got to pay somebody $50,000 from Tik in, <laughs> in order for them to be uh, freed up again. They won't have that money uh, because they didn't properly plan their cash reserves and they're going to be in major trouble in their yeah. business. So this is obviously a much bigger conversation, broader conversation around just strategy of a business. This is just one of those you know, uh, tools or uh, incentives and stimulus that a business can use. There's many others as well. You know, one of the things with Section 179 that we've seen, though, is if you are making those purchases, you have to be very careful on when you actually install it. So you mentioned the example of the machinery. If I was buying a piece of equipment this year, but I wasn't installing, it wasn't getting installed in the Q2 of 2025, that will not qualify. So it's about the purchase. So it is planning, because if you are going to do something that's going to be very specific to that, obviously there's a lead time, um, there's installation, there's a rollout, whatever that might be. But- a businesses should really consider that because if they are, shouldn't wait until December 31st of the year, make purchases, and it doesn't get installed until mid-2025 uh, because you may run into an issue there. Again, we're not providing this tax right. advice, but that's something that businesses should consider. And there's a certain part of the law that allows for a little bit of a delay depending Some, on the yeah. type of things that you're purchasing under Section 179. But correct, the assumption is that the tools or anything that you buy under Section 179 is going to go to work right away for you. Um, and again, the IRS knows exactly why people are doing it. The majority of small businesses, they're going to do it because, A, they think about the tax liability, the number one thing that they're thinking, especially you know if it's a small store or a small business, let's say husband and wife or father and son, hey, man, taxation is a big thing for us this year. I don't really want to write the IRS a big check. And the IRS knows this, that these conversations are happening. The secret that they don't know, though, is the value that you create to the vendors that you're purchasing that equipment from. See, when season starts, and again, I always think about Christmas when I talk about Section 179, and that's because it's the season leading up to Christmas. Mm -hmm. It usually starts in September, and it finishes sometime in December. Similar to when you go to Hobby Lobby, you show the Christmas stuff out. Section 179 has been used throughout the period, the last four months of the year. So now you have a huge influx in the billions, maybe even in the trillions in some cases, of purchases taking place yeah, that economy. persist in the economy. Exactly. Yeah. They go on somebody else's profit and loss statement, and then maybe you pass it down the baton that now they have another problem themselves sure. that everybody's buying equipment from them. Holy crap, now we're making all this money. How are we going to use Section 179? But usually you're talking about bigger vendors who can't take full advantage. Yeah. So that's a big thing of the economy, and the IRS knows this, and that's why many times is lo- is looking to the other way Overlook the fact that, hey, this code might be abused because purchases are going to happen anyways. So when the government then reports GDP data, reports growth, uh, domestic goods, etc., they see a huge increase towards the end of the year. 
Uh, and not because of Black economy. Friday, exactly because of Black Friday or not? It's sometimes yeah. because of Black Friday. Although many of the items you can buy, uh, you need to buy for Section One Seventy Nine. They're not Black Friday items. Yeah, but it helps the economy. It helps the stock market yeah. on the fact. It's a full it, stimulus. Exactly, right? it's, I mean, adds it more jobs to the economy. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So one of the one of the things that I've seen, and I was actually speaking with a business owner, they're like, "Oh, we made all these purchases. Uh, they didn't have proper tax advice from an accountant, uh, which they've made changes there, but." Um, that business owner assumed that they just automatically get it. Um, so I just want to make it very clear and that you actually have to apply. There is a form is under a Section form. 179 exactly. when you submit your taxes on what's going to qualify under Section 179. So it isn't just because you did your taxes. Make sure that you speak with the, your accountant to, to let them know what your plan is, what you're thinking, so that they're prepared for it because – um, once you file your taxes, it's hard to go back and then revisit those um, to apply for any type of incentive like that. Yeah, there was a statistic, I believe 18% of total purchases that were thought believed to be Section 179 fall oh, wow. outside because the business owner did not get the advice of their CPA before they made the purchase. They might have heard somebody else do something. They thought it would apply to their business, et cetera. And then they got stuck with an asset that really was not offering what it was supposed well, to. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, it is. You know, and depreciation can get very complicated very yes. fast. Yeah. So, you know, just keeping track of all those assets. So, so, again, there could be many benefits outside of just the investment. I mean, how you manage your taxes, your profit and loss, financials. Uh, but you brought up a great point that businesses should really keep in mind. I mean, have some reserves. Don't deplete all of that. You need to have some reserves for that rainy day, whatever that, whatever may happen. So you can run operations for three to six months, whatever that time. The more that you can do that, the better. But you don't want to deplete. You don't want to be so focused on building that reserve piece of it where then you're not reinvesting back into the business. That's one thing that I think psychologically some business owners may need to consider. Exactly. And I know we talk about the big companies, the enterprise level companies that, oh, they never pay any taxes, which is far from being accurate. And these are companies that they hold billions on their balance sheet as cash earn from the period, the same fiscal period that we're going through as well. So yes, they do end up paying the first share and they don't mind keeping the cash for an exchange of paying taxes because cash allows them to focus on mergers and acquisition. It looks better on the balances. So when they go borrow more money from their debtors, from their lenders, they're going to be able to acquire a bigger amount of debt because they have better cash flow, more cash in the account. So again, do not burn, put everything under one basket. Section 179 needs to be just one egg in a basket full of eggs and utilized as a tool only when it's essential to be utilized. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate having you in the studio today. Uh, really, it's about building awareness. Um, I mean, there isn't anything that we're offering or we're selling, but whether you're a business owner and you're looking to Chicago firefighting that we hear at Correct. whether you're- We're live, people. We yeah, are live. We are live. So whether you are a business owner who's looking to invest in new equipment, um, improve operations, new technology, expand your business, Section 179 is something that you should consider. And it's really about building that awareness, making sure that you have other options that you should consider and having those discussions to make you more informed in buying process, running your operations, running your business. So really appreciate having you in the studio today. As we wrap up today, like we always do, um, just because... I have you back in here. It's has, it's been a little while since you've it's been, been in a long the time, studio. John. You probably thought for a period of time that you weren't going to get back in here, but you're always a great guest on our on our podcast. I know our audience loves having you on here too. So cheers, uh, cheers, 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 and to a good end of 2024 for all of you out there. Communicate with everybody. Make plans for 2025. Very important. I know we are and be talking about it. And I thought for a while I was missing the title of chief fund officer because I wasn't being invited to fun events like this. We're here. All right. You're back. You're All back. Right. I'm back in the circle. Cheers. Cheers.